Um, this is Joseph Berg. It's the uh, 16th of January, 2015. We are here at the Kramer Library and uh, doing a, a veterans audio interview with Roshana Williams, who is a veteran of the United States Army, who was an aviation operations specialist. And uh, prior to beginning the conversation, or beginning the recording, we were having a conversation about um, kind of what it was to be a, a woman in the military and, and some of the the gender issues that come up in the military. Uh, so to pick up on an earlier conversation, we were talking about rape whistles and sexual assaults. So. I had never had an experience with rape whistles. <laughs> I heard sexual assaults, but I heard more stories of male-on-male -male sexual assault than male-on-female or female-on-male sexual assaults. It was not the classic dark man in the alley attacking a woman stories that I was hearing. But that's what was being portrayed on CNN, what we were getting trained for. Our training videos displayed classic rape. I didn't know him, blah, blah, blah. It was just as I was getting out the military that you started to notice nine times out of ten there was alcohol involved. It's not classic and sometimes it is male on male or male on gang rape male. It's it or gang rape on females. It was, it's not just little things. There were serious sexual assault issues. And um, the stories were closer to home than you would think. All of a sudden, um, somebody would just be arrested in the middle of a, um, a exercise or whatnot, and it'd be somebody you were just talking to, you know, sleeping next to you on a cot, and they're not there anymore. Well, what'd they get arrested for? Oh, he killed his wife after he raped her and put him at the bottom of what we call Moon Lake at Fort Riley. They just found her body. Well, when she died five months ago, it was it was that close to home. Wow. Yeah. So. Well, I would I would say that um, I, I've I've heard that that this the stories are not are not what you typically envision, you know, somebody with a ski mask or right. in a back alley. Um, one of the theories I've heard, and I want to kind of get your take on this, is that if you take people and you put them in a high-stress environment, you take away alcohol, you take away drugs, you take away virtually any kind of time off, that sexuality becomes an outlet for people, that it's one of the few things they have left to them to sort of um, deal with the situation that they're in. I think that's an excuse. Because if you think about it, Geneva Code took away sex between the soldiers too. I mean, sex was gone, alcohol was gone, a lot of freedoms were taken, so you could have your outlet could have been to go find illegal alcohol. It it didn't have to be to finally attack somebody or to attack anyone. Or it, I think that's an excuse. I I don't believe that. I was in the same situation and I got through it. And I didn't rape anybody. Um, it's an excuse. How did you cope? Um, I coped fine with my deployments. Um, they were prior to me becoming a mother. Mm -hmm. So my my. Experience pre-mommy and post-mommy to in the military, two different things. How so? Because that's when the sexism really came to play. When I was raised, I was raised to have male friends. Females were very messy. They could get dangerous, and it's been proven females are just more dangerous growing up than, than males. And um, males could always protect you, have male friends. My cousins were male. I grew up in a house full of males. So when I came to the Army... I, I did the same thing they always did. I just kind of mashed in with the guys, whatever. Um, there was nothing they could say that didn't gross me out. And I'm pretty sure things that I said grossed them out. I'm pretty sure I, I kind of I took them for their money on that aspect. So when we got to Iraq, it wasn't... Um, I was 17, turning 18, so I wasn't allowed to have a rifle yet when I got there. But later, I got one. And my first sergeant could have sent me home, but... They didn't, so I got to stick around, and it was just the Be same. Because you're allowed to enlist at 17 with your right, first permission. Right, right. And I actually, my mother is also, she was also enlisted, has been since I was two. So she was on a deployment at the time, and I couldn't get the paperwork to her. But because she was a single mother when she enlisted, she had to give up custody for two years, and she gave it to my grandmother. My grandmother's 
not the type to say, no, you can't see your kids. So she just like never gave it back. Um, but I did go live with my mother on and off between her PCSs and deployments. So my grandmother actually signed the papers to get me to go. And I went to basic in August of 2008 at 17. And um, by the end of the year, I was in Iraq. So. Before your next birthday? Yeah. Wow. Um, was it in aviation operations? Yes, so that was you my the primary same specialty MOS. Your, yes. your whole time in the army. Yes. So, um, so how did that change when you became a mother? That's when I started noticing the sexism, and it was a lot that was going on in civilian time um, as well. I got pregnant, and I didn't really say anything because I wasn't fat yet. I could still function, and they treated you as if you had leprosy. You can't go to the range. You can't do anything. Go sit in the corner and go sit behind a desk because that's all you're useful for now. Um, I felt very discarded, but I was like, I'm taking it personal. I'm, I'm hormonal. It's, it's not what it is, but it, it really was looking back at it. Um, I gave birth. I came back to work three months after having my son, and I was breastfeeding. Federal law constitutes a 20-minute break every couple hours for breastfeeding mothers, and you had to be given a place to do it that was not a bathroom, and it was also Colorado state law. And you would have thought that I was asking to go home every hour on the hour. I, I was treated like a leper again because I, I couldn't control that bodily function just as mm -hmm. if somebody had to go to the bathroom. And just to go breast pump or go feed my son just became, I, I would hate to have to ask. I would hate to have to, to go handle that. It, it sucked. It, made, it kind of took that joy away from being a mom. And then when it's time to go to the field, you were leaving your kid. And me being a military brat, I know how it felt. And I was always saying, when I'm a mom, I'm not going to do that to my kids. So I was kind of breaking my own promise to myself. So I felt like a piece of crap. And they, nobody cared. Well, you're in the Army. So what? And it was, well, you know, my babysitter canceled on me. What do you want me to do? Well, you're in the Army. You need to figure it out. You need to find somebody. Or there would be people who were nice enough to offer, but no offense, I don't know you. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to leave my kid with you. So it got to be kind of hostile in that regard. But um, So what, what year was your, was your child born? 2012. 2012. So mm -hmm. this is a pretty recent experience. Yeah. Um, do you th did you kind of get the, the blank stare, particularly nursing in general? Breastfeeding has been taboo. Yes, in American society. Did you sort of get that blank look like nobody has ever. Kind of. When I was fat, there was a gang of fat girls. So we we're all pregnant together. We we're all, you know, experiencing this together. And we all kind of gave birth around the same time. So we were all at each other's houses. Breastfeeding was normal. We were girls in the army. We had seen each other with no clothes on. It wasn't. Some of us were in each other's delivery rooms. It wasn't a big deal. And um, I came back to work, and some of the men who had had, like, there were some guys who I'm like, your wife's pregnant again? Those were the ones that are like, oh, yeah, they were the coolest with it. And then you had the ones who hadn't had kids in a while or didn't breastfeed. They were the ones that kind of like, you need to do what? Ew, that's gross. Or go do it in the bathroom. And I'm like, excuse me? Do you eat in the bathroom? Why would you do that? And uh, it, was, it was, I got mixed reactions from everybody. And um, it, it kind of made you feel shameful. My family is not American, so, and even um, in Jamaica, breastfeeding is, they're more open with it. When my mom was stationed in Europe, we were in the flea markets, and you'd see women mm -hmm. just, whatever, boob out, feeding baby. It was, nobody paid in any mind. It wasn't what it was. But in America, it's so taboo, and it's just in the army with, I think there were eight females in my unit, and I was one of two in my section, so it was very weird. And the other female was younger than me, so she was like, oh, that's, she, she it grossed her out too, because she'd never experienced it. So it, I, it made me feel very, not really picked on, but kind of bullied, kind of, you know, ostracized, so. How big was your unit? <sighs> my first unit at Fort Riley, I belonged to an infantry brigade, um, one four, and, I'm sorry, 4-4, four, four. 
and that was probably 2,000 people. But they belong to a division, mm-hmm. so that was probably 50,000 people <laughs> together. But, but when you said there were eight other women in your unit? Uh, that was my recent unit here at Fort Carson. Um, I would say about 300 people. And it was so small because we were attack Apache Battalion, mm-hmm. and we were the only one here in Colorado, and for the most part on this side of the United States. So when something happened from Japan all the way to Colorado, that was us. So eight, eight women out of 300... Um, it's fairly, fairly small population. And not all of them you could just walk up to and say, hey, how's your day? They were varying in ranks. Mm-hmm. So you had, you know, maybe three privates and the rest were high-ranking in officers, which once they weren't new officers anymore, they really didn't talk to us. They were, they were too good for us, so <laughs> we didn't really pay them any mind. Um, you know, it's, it's funny, in the previous interview with Tara and, and his... Uh, thinking about my own military experience, we use the term female. I used the term female before I was in the army, just because. I just because you're you're female, doesn't make you a woman. So, I will I will use it for a reason, um, and I've always had. And even in the army, through brute camp, they would make you. She's not a girl. She's a soldier. She's a female. They would correct. During their brainwashing, they would correct people's vocabulary mm-hmm. to the point that you didn't. You got home and you start talking to people, and they're like, "What?" They didn't realize it, but yeah, they 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 will tear you down and build you back up with something new. So it just kind of you you don't even realize you're doing it. But most of the time, why do you think that is? Why do you think that that the military wants you to have? A, perhaps an anatomical identity, but not a a gender identity. Preparation and trust, because when my example, my eye-opening example is when we got to Iraq and they were sending pregnant women and children to the, the, the FOB with these bomb vests on, you, it doesn't matter what gender you were. If that person was coming next to you or your buddy in a vehicle, it's about protecting the person beside you. So I don't care who it was. You're going to have to shoot this pregnant mom, two-year-old child, or whoever in the head. They don't want to do it. Some of them were hostage. Some of them were willing. But it wasn't about it. It can't be seen as a weakness or an advantage. That is that is it's equal across the board. They're a threat. They're a threat. If they're friendly, they're friendly. It, you, it It's a matter of survival. So they are preparing you to deal with situations like that to survive. To make rapid categorizations. Right. About. It's it's just decision, like a quick second decision. You can't sit there and wonder, well, I wonder how many months pregnant she was and who sent her. Honestly, it doesn't matter. That None of those things matter. Is she dangerous or not? Has that stayed with you? Yes. To the point, I just went home to... Um, I went to high school in Florida when my mom was stationed in Jacksonville at NAS Jacks, and I was talking to a friend of mine, and her mom was a pastor, and she's like, you're talking as if you read the news yesterday. And I was like, well, honestly, I see ISIS beheadings on television right now, and it's nothing, it's nothing we haven't seen before. My mom just recently went to, she came back from Afghanistan while um, my son was about five months old when she got back, so that I had already given birth. And she is in the Navy. She is a medical corpsman. Mm -hmm. So she works closely with the Marine. And she said one day she um, got called out to the scene and she opened the Humvee door. It was an armored Humvee. And there was literally nothing left of a person. But there was pink matter and blood everywhere. The person had been obliterated. And she just stood there and cried. But because you're not behind the wire, you're not behind any extra protection, you cannot do that. You can't break down like that. But it stuck with her. She called me that night, or her night, my day, to tell me, but you you can't deal with that right then and there. you got to store it away and keep it moving because you still have to protect people beside you and yourself. So um, I know she has her story. I think almost every vet has their different trauma story doesn't have to be as, as bloody and gruesome, but I think every vet who who had at least been, and I, I know talking to the older vets, I feel like we fight cowardly compared to them because they had the the uh, the knife 
batons and the, the they they were hand to hand in combat. I could not deal, but they were doing it. They were sleeping in the forest. Stuff that we complain about now, they were doing as if it was nothing. So when I tell you I have more respect for them than for the people are doing now in the army, I, hats off all day because I, I could not, <laughs> I, I could not at all. But uh, I think they 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 earn the respect that they get. But I think every vet has a story to the point that um, they realize it's real and. You either become sensitized to it to the point you can't handle it, or you you have to become desensitized to it and keep moving. That was, it kind of comes back to the first question I asked you about, um, how do you cope? Well, what what did you do, because you, you were in both Iraq and Afghanistan. Yeah. And so it's not adventure every minute. No. Um, what do you do to keep yourself safe? Iraq, sane? because I was there as it was closing. Once we traveled to different bases or COBs, that's when we got most of the excitement. But to crit, Iraq and Spiker, we were protecting the women's college that were outside. Uh, that was kind of in the city, probably about maybe 10 miles away from us. So we heard, we heard a couple sonic booms. I would open my eyes, make sure I was still in peace, and go back to sleep. Um, during the time, I did not realize how important it was. I didn't think there was much to cope with. I was like, yeah, we're here. We're almost home, whatever. The pay was good. Like I said, I'm 17 going on 18. I didn't know what to do with 20 grand in my account, but I was going to figure it out when I got home. It was it was going to get worked out. But um, I didn't think much of it until, like I said, those days we saw stuff, and I was like, wow. And I don't think I saw, I thought much of it until I came home, and I was just functioning normally, and stuff like that was making the news. And I'm like, yeah, so, like, they didn't realize how normal it was. And to me, it was like, yeah, it happened a couple times, and it wasn't new. So um, later on, I struggled with anxiety and depression. I think that was more post-mommy because now I know the dangers that are in the world, mm -hmm. and I feel a stronger protection. Like, I need to protect my son that much more because I know what's out there, and I've seen it. So that will, I, I know his dad will tell me, you need to chill out. Like, you're, you're, you're making up, you know, stuff for yourself to be anxious about and worried about. And he's going to be a kid. He's going to bump his head. He's going to, you know, grow. But you, you have to separate the two realities. That was the reality of a whole different continent, a whole different world, a whole different time. And this is kind of middle America. Nothing's going on like that. But when you see schools getting shot up and movie theaters, it kind of brings that worry back like you never know. So for me, it's not really a cope. It's kind of a day-to-day -day struggle with the anxiety. So it reflects later. Even if you have to put it in your pocket and think about it later, it comes back to haunt you, some people in different ways. So, Well, happier train of thought. <laughs> um, and I've asked this question in the past, if you're just in to see. What, what did you think was, was the best moment of your time in the Army? Good question. <laughs> mm, for me, I guess looking back at all of my friends who were still not doing any things with their lives, not, um, and even if they were, I still felt some sort of pride in doing what I was doing when I was doing it, um, compared to them, that they, some of them were having kids and smoking weed and just kind of the same old, same old and hadn't progressed, and some of them didn't even go to college, and I was doing school, I had been deployed, I, I felt very dependent, so it did provide that feeling, but I don't think there was one moment, one ceremony when I was like, you know what, I'm the shit. I like this. I don't I don't I don't have that. And if I did while I was in the army, it wasn't army related. So that's fair enough to ask. <laughs> I mean, you're not you're not in the army anymore. I am um, in the Colorado National Guard, so technically I am. In the same specialty? No, I have reclassed to um field artillery. So so one of the first females to get to the unit, so I'm experiencing that crap all over again. I was going to say, that's a non-traditional assignment. <laughs> yeah. they, they just opened up these MOSs to females, so taking advantage. If you're physically able to, to take it on, they will put you in that slot, and 
kind of left to fend for yourself. What size guns? Um, they have a plethora. They are some that will sit on their legs as if they're a spider, and they can shoot up to 18 miles away. There are guns. Um, I haven't touched any of them, and I haven't been trained on them yet. My um, MOS was kind of the same as I was in um, aviation. It was just switched over to the field artillery side. So I'm still working with the same computers. I'm still tracking the traffic. You know, we know not to shoot our own helicopters out the air, just like I was when I was in aviation. So um, I'm there getting my, my um, earlobes, my ears, you know, ringing with them, but I'm not touching anything, and I really don't want to. So, And we walk around the battery, and everybody's yelling. And you just think they're loud, but they seriously can't hear each other. So, it's common now <laughs> the artillery units. So I'm like, I'm right here. Why are you yelling at me? So, this is also a common problem with aviation units. It too. is, but um, <laughs> aviation's catching up on it. They're getting more ear ear earmuffs, and you know, because we I was doing that as a papa. We'd walk our VIPs out to the helicopters, and um, it does get loud out there. We didn't wear headgear on our help. We we knew better. Because you, you'd have a hat, and then you'd have two halves of a hat. So <laughs> either, either you didn't wear it, or you had a um, you had an actual helmet on. So we, we had the hearing problems, too, in aviation, but I do not think it's as, it's as bad. And the pilots were, they usually have their own protection, and we had ours. So it's a little bit different. They were out there, even though they have protection, there's no eluding that sound when it goes off and continue, it's it's shaking your bones. So I don't even think it's more of the, um, I don't know how to separate the two because I know sounds are vibrations, but I think the damage is more coming from that, that big old boom, you feeling it, than the actual sound. I know it makes sense, but the people's teeth, I will notice, are shattered because they're, when they do go off, they're, they're biting their, their, own, their own teeth together to the point that they're shattering. So I was like, okay. Yeah, it's like, you guys don't notice this? Oh, it's nothing. It's a battle wound to them. I'm like, whatever. Uh, <laughs> there's there's no way I'm getting my teeth back. <laughs> I'm like, okay. It's not common, but I did notice it. I was like, what? So the stories are funny. But like I said, it's I am one of two females there now out of a whole 5,000 people. So it's just that whole upward balance. And I'm still pumping at the end of the day every day so it, I just have, I have to re-educate on what I need to do when I need to do it and it's just and they have men have no in the units they have no privacy when it comes to females because they see you as just one of the guys they just kind of uh, they don't realize yeah we're sharing the bathroom because you not walk in when I'm changing into my dress uniform it's just kind of they don't they kind of don't see you sometimes so it's kind of awkward but Upside, I wear my dress uniform, and the commander can't correct me because he doesn't know any better. <laughs> he's, <laughs> he's never even been, <laughs> he's never had a. And our uniforms are based different off of males. Ours is based to our bust size. So whatever the size of your breast is, where the size of your your buttons are going, and your measurements are different. And they're like, I think it looks right. They don't know, and they don't want to challenge you because they're like, most likely she knows the regulation. So. They're, they don't say anything, but it's freaking hilarious because they're like, uh, yeah. yeah. But you, you don't want to laugh because you know, like, I'm getting away with murder right now, so. Yeah, well, it is, it is you know, for, for guys, the, the, you know, the uniform regulation will be, well, you know, your ribbons go at the top of the pocket. But because of the bus line. And we don't have a pocket on our jackets, uh, on our jeans, army jackets. Do not, so. that's right. Yeah. And it has to be tilted a little to right. accommodate for best Right, line. so our breasts fit. And then it depends on what size, what kind of bra you have on. Mm -hmm. And for me, that can vary throughout the day because my breasts will swell or mm -hmm. not, depending on. So you, they couldn't really say anything. But I did catch another female who walked in with some Tim Burton heels on with her dress uniform. I was like, okay. Now you know the commander not saying anything to you because he doesn't know, but I'm pretty and everybody's given that suspicious eye. But every all the males are scared to say anything. They didn't know, but I had to tell her. It's like you know you're wrong, right? Oh yeah, I knew. I just didn't bring my uniform. So good and bad things. You kind of have to make that. Um, you have to push that bar and set it so they know. Well, that's what it's supposed to look like. One of them have to be wrong, you know. So I, I remember mediating a. Uh an argument between a, 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 a two soldiers I had. Uh, 
one girl was very mad at the other who was African American. Oh my gosh, get over it. Okay. Well, <laughs> not not because of her skin color, no, because but... of the hair. Because she, what she could do was um, she kept her hair cropped really short, and on the weekends when she would go out in civilian clothes, she would put in a weave. She could do that. The white girl said, well, I don't have that luxury. I Yes, you do. Yeah. And it was a conversation that was very alien to me. <laughs> because I don't know anything about women's hairstyles. I don't know. And that's actually a big thing on CNN right now. Because me as a black woman, my mom... Like I said, I, I do have a Jamaican family. Locks and dreads and whatnot and braids are very popular where we're from. And the Navy and the Army just came out with regulations says that we can't wear them. And it's very hard because I have what we call natural hair in the black community. I don't have um, chemically streamed hair. So we will be told, and I'm saying we as African-American women will be told that our natural hair is unprofessional. And it really hurts because it's what's growing out. of You can't help it. It's like your skin color. So um, there there are regulations saying we can't dread. Well, white women braid their hair all the time. Why can't you know black women do that? It's even though it may look messier, our hair is different. It's just a different. But it's we're being told it's unprofessional. So it's a really big thing on CNN right now, and they're bowing over it. But she's absolutely right. And she, the white girl, could have worn a weave, and the black well, girl, she could do that. It's in the Marine Corps. You're not allowed if you you have to have ethnically appropriate hair. That's why you're in which, uniform. I'm saying while it's oh, on the yeah. weekend, she had that option. Now while you're in uniform, um, technically you're not allowed to wear a weave in the army mm-hmm. while you're in uniform unless mm-hmm. you're balding, or I forgot another reason. But braids are acceptable, and um, a couple other hairstyles are acceptable. But they were saying twist couldn't be because they looked faddish. But it's been something that Africans have been doing since. Jesus was walking. <laughs> so you mean by like cornrows, right? No, just a two-strand twist. They were saying that y'all can't do that. Huh. And then they were saying um, certain braids like these, they couldn't be very small. But they don't realize how, how, how high maintenance black hair is compared to white hair. When we're doing our hair that small, it's to last us because we don't have the the heat to do our hair to make it that silky straight to accommodate to make it look professional mm-hmm. like they want it to so we will wear those small braids and for me this is easy my braids are easy because I get up and go in the morning and I can't do I feel her hair is easier to handle than my natural hair so they'll do that in the military because we already don't have time to wash our own asses compared to hair so they didn't realize how much they were limiting these black women to you know just pretty much survive <laughs> with their, you know, deployments and whatnot, just getting through with their hair. And they're like, oh, cut it off. Well, why do I have to cut mine off? She doesn't have to cut hers off. It was, it's not really, I, I don't think they're trying to be racist, but they're not considering everything when they're making these, you know. Well, I think a lot of, a lot of civilians would be amazed to the extent that the military dictates Mm-hmm. Your your appearance, mm-hmm. but um, that that perception comes from the civilian world. Well, your afro isn't um, it isn't professional. Well, I'm just wearing my hair out. My hair just happens to stand straight up instead of laying down. She wears her hair out, and mine it looks two different things, but it's not professional because of what was seen in the '70s and a lot of that that error mm-hmm. and the hairstyle. It there go hand in hand. So they think negatively because the Black Panthers wore afros and. It's not the same thing. It's just what we were born with. So it, it's coming from the civilian world and being carried into the military. So, But, yeah, they dictate down to the length mm-hmm. of our nails. And the color of your nail and polish. And the color of our nail mm-hmm. polish. And the color of your makeup. And, yeah. So kind of sucks being an army, but, hey. So when we do get weekends and you do see those military females out in the town with, like, eight different shades of makeup on, let them have it. <laughs> they've, they've been like, yeah, like, trust me, they've been like that for a while. So they're just trying to experience some, you know, sexual freedom. They're trying to let their femininity out. So just, you know they look retarded. You know they look like a clown, but let, let them have it. It's, they're just trying to feel like a girl again because there are times where before they came out with the sanitary policy it was more than three days before we could shower and you know we were living off baby wipes so 
Just let them have it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's... Um, the, that was actually one of the... Uh, one of the oddest issues to have to solve in mixed gender units was uh, latrine facilities and um, in such a way that everybody was happy and comfortable with it. I can tell you right now, me just getting out the army, I was in the field last October, I'm lying, the October before that, October of 13, with my Apache unit here on Carson. And um, they gave us rooming by section and of course we had two females one of them she went to go sleep with um, another unit's female I don't mind sleeping with the males in my unit um, I more than trust them I know their wives it was a pretty cool unit but it was more I think they were more uncomfortable with having me there than me being there because mm-hmm. I had some males question me like uh, are you supposed to be here yeah why like we're not supposed to be changing in front of every you know each other mm-hmm. anyway male on male or not um, so I think I did, I did get that vibe, like, you don't really want me to be here, but I didn't care. I would leave when, you know, it was time to shower. That's when they would do whatever they wanted to do that they weren't supposed to be doing in the living quarters anyway. And, um, we would sleep. It's not like, you know, we had queen beds to sneak into each other. It was, it was very relaxed. Um, we did not share showers yet, but they were very close. Mm-hmm. Same amount of showers with the, as the males. And I would actually walk with my in, my male NCO to the showers because sometimes we'd get all shit and it was pitch black. We didn't have, we were in almost the um, New Mexico border. So we were pretty out there and all you had was the stars. So I'd walk with him and um, he would smoke. So he'd wait for me because I'm a girl. I take longer. So <laughs> he'd wait for me and we'd walk back. It wasn't a big of a deal in my unit, but it did seem to make the males more uncomfortable than it did the females. I don't know if because they're scared of the the catch-up game. Um, some people just get the finger pointed because he yelled at me, so I'm going to blame him for rape, and I'm telling you it happens, and I'm sure you know it happens. So I don't know if that's it, or I don't know if there's just that taboo, like we're supposed to sleep separately, but it that's started hot. happening. So It's a hot topic in the, in the media right now. And with the army does not have the money to accommodate all this yeah. stuff anymore. We're downsizing. The wars are over. We're not getting a lot of money. So when they say, hey, one cent for everybody, you better find your corner. Just deal because dude, that's that's what's up now. So I know it's not, you know, what they used to be, but they, they've noticed they've been wasting a lot of money when soldiers are supposed to be disciplined in the first place. You shouldn't be doing anything you're not supposed to be doing. So, But if it does happen, please believe they were coming down with iron fist. I mean, registered sex offender in all. You had no life after that. So get caught if you want to. <laughs> but uh, it, was, it was going down. But I think in my unit, I don't think it was a big problem. My unit here in Colorado. Because like I said, they started integrating before I left. Right. But it wasn't a, a problem at your unit in Riley. Yes. Yes, it was a big issue, big, big issue to the point that um, Sergeant Major Champagne, he um, he came down to several units, and he was the division Sergeant Major, somebody who would go visit the president on the norm, who, you know, he was, he was up there talking to us, telling us, like, I dare you, <laughs> I dare you. He was, he was pretty pissed, because it's, it all comes back on CNN, and the Army hates bad publicity. Mm. And normally when it happened, when it went to CNN, like, stuff started changing. Like, now that the public knew, they're like, okay, we got to clean up our mess. So they didn't want it to go there. So they, they, they were coming down with it. They were ending careers. And um, I did see a lot of uneven punishment, though, because there were officers, high-ranking officers. I know a general who had his girlfriend in his tent in Iraq. Kuwait, something like that, and they let him retire, and he got all his benefits. Mm-hmm. He just had to, he was pretty much just fired, mm-hmm. but I'm like, really? You got this staff sergeant over here who probably, you know, he had been through a little bit more than this commander, you know, just sitting there pointing fingers, and he got his, you know, jail time, had to register as a sex offender. I'm not saying he doesn't deserve it, but I don't think that officer deserve what he got either. I think it should it should be equal all across the board, but I did see that uneven punishment when it came to rank. So I was like, wow, that that's not cool. I actually followed that case pretty closely. Yeah, so I was like, are you serious? That's all he got? 
really and he was married so that's um in the army cheating on your spouse is illegal so it, and it's still in, in many states adultery is not yeah i know but yeah i army, know um, in, in the military yeah that's and i know a lot of southern country. states it is louisiana and mississippi you can still take somebody over civil court for sleeping with your husband so <laughs> it's possible so he he didn't i felt like he got away and supposedly he had raped this female and he'd been in a relationship with another and all the time he was married and all the time it was kind of paraded around the unit like he was he wasn't doing anything wrong and it was accepted and nobody called him out until she reported him so I was like that's and he was more brazen than you know Joe so I was like really he gets that I know I understand you got court martial and I understand that goes on your your record but that's not punishment. He's going to get, he, he got retirement, meaning that he got what he was going to get when he was ready to settle down anyway. Mm-hmm. That's not a pun, that's not a loss of anything. So. Well, you, you might be interested to know that, that the example that I brought up to start the conversation earlier was his justification. Yeah. Um, you know, that, well, this was the way he dealt with the stress of combat or. He didn't do nothing. Okay. <laughs> when you're that high in rank, like the most the, the most time you leave the wire is to go, you know, visit some other special VIP. You're not out there getting shot at. You're, and when we did have VIPs die, it was because they were en route to go visiting another VIP. They weren't in combat. They weren't doing anything. So when you talk about stress, it was political stress. That was... Trust me, it wasn't, oh, somebody's shooting at me, let me duck under a cover, and I have no other option but to take my anger out on this female. Bull crap. <laughs> I, I, I think this is really a, a good last topic that, that I'd, I'd kind of like to explore a little bit. So the military, uh, Americans, I th- my belief is, make a big deal out of uh, at least a quality of opportunity. The, you know, the sense that we're all in the middle class. Nobody wants to present themselves as being above somebody else. Yet in the military, very explicitly, there is a rank structure. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'd like to ask your opinion. Is that easier to accommodate when that sort of class structure is formalized, it's there, it is part of everyday life, um, or is it, you think, you know, in everyday society the same thing exists, it's just not acknowledged. I mean, how do you, how does the way the army creates its, its class structure, how does that feel to you? How does it seem to you? For me, it was a no-go. I do not have a type A personality. Um, and I believe in what you're saying. Everybody's equal. I don't care how much you make. I don't care where you came from. I don't care what you do with your past. We're all equal. So um, me going into the Army, I didn't find it hard until it became... Um, when I got to the units and they would pretty much use that rank to say, yeah, I'm better than you and you need to take out my trash. Technically, no, that's not what I'm here for. And just because you're higher ranking than me doesn't mean that I clean up after you. I'm not your mate. That's not what I'm here to do. That's when it became a problem for me. But I had no problem giving Sergeant Major respect because that same respect I was giving Sergeant Major, I would give to a battle. It, it was equal for me. But, um, and if Sergeant Major came and had a conversation with me, I would talk to him, you know, with respect, same difference, but I would have a normal conversation. Other people, especially um, my NCOs at the time before I became an NCO, um, they would, you don't just talk to Sergeant Major like you're friends. Oh, he approached me like that, and he's nobody, he's not royalty, he's not, he's nobody different. So it was very hard for me to realize that, yes, there is an ego behind the rank, and they they were all into it, and their, their co, co-ranking people were all into it because they, they, they just wanted to keep their egos up, they wanted to keep that name up. Well, I'm a Sergeant Major, and I don't associate, and there were some who thought differently. So I, I had a very hard time with it because I'm like, you're, you're, no, you're still, you know, underneath it all, we, we put our pants on one leg at a time. We are the same. So I didn't have an issue when it came to the actual rank structure. It was the attitudes behind it. Like, well, you're a piece of crap because you're an only an E1. Excuse me? And it, it got that way when it came to um, financial issues, too. There would be, 
you know, um, first sergeants who were, well, I don't have enough gas money, and they were telling our commanders that. And compared to privates who were buying homes, and well, you don't know what you're doing because you're a private, but commanders or who else didn't understand that that private's 47 years old. That's a grown ass man. <laughs> he can do what he wants. Your rank does not reduce you to whatever you are. But I found that a lot of them think that way. So, like I said, I had a hard time with it. Um, I was dating somebody who was higher ranking than me until recently, and it's just even speaking with him because he had been in for so long. He was like, "Oh, you got this? Really? You you have a degree? Well, you're so and so. You're just an, an E four. What does that have to do with anything? It was so reducing. Like so, like I had a life before the army, or even while I was in the army. Like it's just it's very weird how they associate your pay grade." with what you should have accomplished by that time. So I was like, okay, you, you guys are weird. It's just odd. Oh, you own a home? You're, you're only so-and-so. So I'm not you. I don't drink away my paycheck. I, I, everybody's different. But at the same time, don't, don't associate your, their rank with, their, uh, with where they should be in life. It was very weird. It didn't make sense to me. So. Well, would you agree with the statement that, that people internalize that differently like people the degree to which that becomes part of their identity their their some picture people, of who, who they are some people I was not one of them so I could not testify <laughs> but because to me it was just a day job it was a way to pay for school when I signed up I signed up to pay for school that was it um I didn't take it to heart I was never a ho-ho as they say I Oh, sing the army song and mean it. I didn't mean a word of it, but I'm singing it. You know, it's just I'm just here to get what I want, and I was using them as much as they were using me. So, for some people, they take it to hey, this is my country, and blase, blase, and we're gonna fight. Hey, I'm just trying to protect you. <laughs> I, I really, I had no philosophy behind it. Um, I did not really believe in the Iraq War, or that again, I kind of believe in mind your own business. So. But I was there. I didn't say, oh, I'm not going to do it because I don't believe. Nope, I need the Army as much as they need me. So it was it's kind of kind of odd just that people would be like, well, you know, I'm a sergeant in the U.S. But it's like they don't realize that once that over, once that, that phase in your life is over, what else do you have? You're, you've been, you know, a sergeant in the Army for, for how long? Like now that that part of your life is over, I saw a lot of people, including the person I was dating, depression would creep in. And a kind of a, a loss for what to do with themselves. They they didn't know how to function out in the civilian world because they, like I said, that brainwashed stuff. That type A personality took over, and it was just kind of odd to function in the normal world. And for me, it was like I'm sleeping in. No more. <laughs> it was instant. I didn't. I never took it to the head. So. And some people, oh, it's so hard for me to transition back. And I'm like, no, I, I've been ready to go. The day, you know, I signed up, I've been ready to go. <laughs> I'd never intended on making it a career, never took any of it to heart. I do feel a sense of pride hearing the national anthem, but uh, I think that's, it's it's more of a pride from being in the Army, but I felt it prior to. So, um, yeah, I do feel like, yeah, you know, I did that. I've, I'm proud of myself for doing that and completing service honorably and all that stuff, but I, I never took it to the head. So I think I think it's awesome that you have that level of insight. Yeah, um, <laughs> I, I really do. I, I, um, so it's been a good interview, um, but I I think I should probably ask you at this point if there's if there's any sort of final thought or, or, or final idea you might want to leave to anybody that listens to this in the future. Um, I think I'm going to piggyback off what Tara was saying. A lot of the issues coming from the war or um, veterans are coming on without jobs. A lot of them are sick, not just physically but mentally. Um, don't be quick to judge because you never you know what they went through, what they're going through. There's more than one type of PTSD. Um, and I, I always try to treat people how I want to be treated. Just try to do the same, especially when you come in contact with vets because I know sometimes I do feel ungratitude towards people civilians and um if you could pay it forward anyway i think you should not it doesn't have to be financially but if you see somebody you know you know is a vet having a hard time 
you don't even have to. If you can't help them, got it. But just sit down having a conversation, knowing that somebody cares. It's a very heartwarming feeling because they don't feel as alone. But, um, yeah, I, I think that'd be it. Just don't judge because you don't know what, what they went through, what happened, or how they did it. Or, And I learned my lesson from talking to those older vets from Vietnam and, and D-Day and going back because they um, – they had it way harder than us, and I didn't judge. I knew um, they had been through things, but you know, visiting the World War II Museum in New Orleans, Louisiana, and watching most of the movies, I think the most recent one came out last year in 2014, was um, Fury mm-hmm. of a Tanker, and they they were for their country. So, uh, like I said, that one of them survived, um, but you, you never know how he functioned the rest of his life, seeing everything that he saw. It, it's it's impossible to function normal, normally as if nothing happened because it's very traumatic. So that's, that's all I would have to say. Just try not to judge. Try to be as you know clear across as possible. I appreciate that. Um, again, this has been uh, Roshana Williams, uh, interviewed by Joseph Berg on the 16th of January, 2015 at the Kramer Library. And it's been a terrific interview. Thank you.